Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Storytime with BDD. I'm your host, BDD, a.k.a. Brooklyn Dad. And folks, today, my guest has been to many places, and it hasn't been a smooth road. In fact, it's been a little rocky. He's been to Ukraine. Uh, He's been everywhere from Ukraine to Detroit to Brooklyn, to Florida. He's even been to the White House. Uh, He's been all over, and he has some lessons learned and some stories to share. Our next guest was at the center of a scheme to extort a new president of Ukraine. But then he redeemed himself by publicly coming out against Trump and cooperating with federal prosecutors investigating Rudy Giuliani. He is now in the post-cult of Trump, and he remembers. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my guest, Lev Parnas. Lev, glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me, BDD. Thank you. That's terrific. Uh, it, it, looks, uh, it, it looks nice and, and sunny warm where you are. You've, what's, what's the uh, temperature over there? Today it's like 87. It's beautiful, Florida. Florida. Oh, so jealous, so jealous. But you know, New York's always Brooklyn's always my hometown and always in my heart. But you know, you can't beat the weather here in Florida. That's what I wanted to say. You and I have something in common. We have few things in common, but one of them it happens to be the fact that you did spend some time in Brooklyn. Uh, specifically, you you did go to Brooklyn College, yeah. Yep, uh, I went to Brooklyn College for a year, about about one semester. How how long did you spend uh, in Brooklyn? Oh, I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, after I immigrated to the United States uh, as a refugee in 1976, uh, we stayed a short time in uh, Detroit, Michigan, until I had a, an accident there. I got hit, hit by a car and ended up in the hospital in a six month body cast, and my father. Uh, ended up in the hospital at the same time with me with a heart attack because he was trying, you know, help get the car off of me at that time. Uh, that's how we actually, that was within the first six months of us coming to the United States after uh, uh, fleeing uh, uh, the Soviet Union at the time. And uh, after that, uh, well, shortly after that, we moved to New York, uh, New York, uh, Brighton Beach area. It was called Little Odessa. So, you know, it's because it's on the ocean uh, and uh, there's a lot of huge Ukrainian, uh, Russian, uh, well, not Russian at the time. We were all Soviet, Soviet Jews, basically. Because mm-hmm. at the time mm-hmm. there was no Russia or Ukraine, it was all the Soviet Union. And we were all refugees and we all settled there. So uh, since about 1978, 79, around like that. Uh, I basically grew up there, went to, you know, junior high school, high school, middle school, college, a little bit of college, uh, worked on uh, Wall Street, and and then at some point I moved down here to sunny Florida. You know, I, um, I know that you live down in Florida, but when you speak, I hear the Brooklyn in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> my wife says you could take you out of Brooklyn, but we can't take Brooklyn out of you. <laughs> Dude, that's my saying! <laughs> It's <laughs> absolutely right. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm curious. Do you have? Uh, do you know any folks who lived in uh, Sunset Park? Um, not really Sunset Park, but uh, I mean, all over, primarily. I mean, everywhere in Brooklyn. I don't know. Maybe even Sunset Park. I don't know. Lately, you, you heard what yeah. happened. Obviously, it was just a, such a sad situation. I mean, that's just uh, incredible. I don't know. 
uh, this man definitely has to have mental problems. Uh, there's no other doubt about it. Uh, yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, I, I see, you know, I didn't see too much of it, but I've heard, you know, that he was posting some really crazy stuff on social media. And, I, and, I, and I'm a proponent of think, you know, that we should have more stricter, you know, some way the, the enforcement out there should look into social media because a lot of you, you see a lot of these crimes, even like, you know, we had the park room to shooting here in Florida, a lot of these sick individuals actually post before they even go and do it. You could see signs of what's going on. Yeah. And if we could, you know, try to catch them ahead of time, I think we could stuff it. Just a godsend. And thank God, you know, today's Passover. It's a big holiday, you know, in my religion. And, uh, you know, thank God nobody died, you know, miraculously. I mean, watching, the, you know, listening to the, watching the video, listening to them, just, the, you know, thank, you know, thank God that I was saying, died. Was wicked, but yeah, just I, very, very tragic. I was saying it, it's amazing how quickly they caught him because, you know, in this day and age, most people are looking at their phones, you know, and yeah. they're not looking at their surroundings. You're looking around and about. So um, that was surprising and, and a relief that they did catch him as quickly yeah. as they did. Big time, big time relief, because, you know, if he was capable of doing that, who knows what could have been next, you know. So, yeah, thank God he's in custody and he's off the streets. Lev, I have a trivia question for you. Sure. And this is ahead. This is separate from our guessing game later on. <laughs> um, can you tell me um, where the largest Ukrainian community in America resides? Which state? No, uh, I, oh, I, I, I think I know now. It's uh, in Cleveland, in Ohio. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that answer is incorrect. Chicago? Where is it? We're, we're in New York, baby. Still New York. I was going to say, you know, I was going to say New York, but I thought it was a trick question because lately we were talking to, you know, because with, with all the help I'm doing behind the scenes, it was like a lot is, is in Chicago and Ohio, but New York, I'm glad. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a huge uh, Ukrainian population. No, in... I know. I mean, <laughs> I was part of it. I just, I thought it was a trick question. So I went against myself on that one. Now, you came over to the United States with your parents when you were uh, three, right? Yeah. Was it three? And you went to Detroit? Uh, yeah, we first ran this pictures from Detroit. This was actually uh, where my mom and dad got officially married here in the States when we just landed, and that's my sister. That was uh, when we moved, uh, right, right before we moved to New York, we went to Florida for one year. My mom had mm. a job opportunity, and we lived in Vero Beach, and I played baseball. That's in Florida. Uh, that was in. That's when we just got. This is back in based. Detroit, yeah. <laughs> this is no. This is in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> now, did you ever? Did you ever feel like you didn't quite fit in at school or in the neighborhood because of where you came from? Did you ever experience anything uh, like that? Oh, big time. I mean, uh, when we came over, uh, you have to keep in mind, it was during now in the Cold War. It was like really uh, Americans didn't know, they thought Russians were, or Soviet Union people were uh, Martians. Mm. And uh, they used to touch me, see if I was red or, you know, if I was there. But it was weird when I was a child. Uh, I received, you know, people would uh, tease me all the time. I used to get into lots of fights trying to, you know, defend myself because of uh, people attacking at me, but it was really rough until I got to like New York uh, when we settled into Brighton Beach uh, because it was a much bigger already Ukrainian Russian uh, community. So it was much easier uh, to get along. But prior to that, uh, the first, like I'd say about four years, five years into the child was really rough, especially in Detroit because, you know, they thought I was a Martian. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. But you know what? It's 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 very real. I mean, kids can be stupid. Kids, can, yeah. I, oh, they could be mean. Kids could be really mean. Yeah, I have six kids of my own, so I know how you know. I, I go through it and and uh, six kids. Six kids. Okay, so you <laughs> you and I. Um, I was I was gonna say you and I have a lot in common, but you kind of beat me. <laughs> you beat me. Actually, you beat me by one. I got five, right? Uh, uh, well, those are the here. That's five of them, and the little one, the four month old. She was just born four months ago. Olivia Rose. She's my precious little angel. You have a very beautiful, beautiful family. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Um, now, one of one of your children here, I believe, in the center is Aaron. <laughs> My pride and joy. <laughs> uh, indeed. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Aaron? Go ahead and uh, 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 do your proud from, dad thing. Uh, from the day he was born, I mean, he was always like a, he was one of those, you know, Doogie Howser whiz kids. Uh, he he was he was an eight year old in a twenty five year old body, a ten year old in a thirty. I mean, he aged really quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. He was always ahead of the game, and I have to give him credit and his mom credit because when he went to uh, high school, he decided to take. I, I, at that time, I was out of it. I was traveling. I was in a different world, you know, uh, trying to make money, trying, you know, running for that power, chasing the dream. And uh, he uh, decided uh, to, that he was going to do high school and college classes at the same time. He ended up graduating college before he graduated high school and went to George Washington Law School uh, at 18 years old, which uh, we were just amazed. And, you know, when we were at his graduation and the, and the principal, uh, the president of the school got up and said, you know, we have one of the youngest kids graduating, you know, uh, mm. with everybody here with honors. Uh, you know, and we stood up as parents, and that probably is to this day is one of the proudest moments of my life. And uh, and then, uh, I mean, I'm gonna pop if he's watching right now, I'm gonna say, Sorry that I put him through all the craziness, but uh, he, <laughs> you gotta understand, he goes to law school at 18 years old, he's already yeah. has the pressure of the world on him, everybody there's looking at him, and now his father is uh, best friends with Trump, Giuliani, and the crew. And I was living in Washington simultaneously, but at the Trump International Hotel. And I remember I would constantly, you know, push him to come sit with us, sit in meetings, visit, and, you know, try to push him into politics. And he would always stay away and we would argue. And I would say to my wife, what's wrong with him? Like, doesn't he realize, like, you know, because I remember I even got him a job at the White House and he turned it down. And I couldn't mm. understand until after mm. my arrest and we have our, had our hearts of hearts and he was able to then become free. And obviously uh, anybody that watches or follows him sees, you know, he's a real fighter for democracy. And I was holding him back, you know, those few years. Uh, but I think it was a really good lesson for him. He got to see the other side. He got to see really it close up <laughs> of how bad certain people are. And I think that what gives him the power and the courage to go out there and to do what he does. So I'm extremely proud of him. You know, he's a lawyer now at 22 you know, years old. He's a lawyer. He's a, a Democratic strategist, a TikTok uh, <laughs> superstar. So, you know, God bless him, you know. Love you know, him. what's interesting is that usually, <coughs> uh, usually our kids are doing everything they can to make us proud. You know, that's, that's the dynamic there. The kids, they don't, want us to be disappointed but as you as you're speaking to me about that that dynamic i hear that he was kind of disappointed in you for oh, hanging time. out huh? oh big time no i mean one of the best things to this day that i say that happened to me was me getting arrested uh, because uh, no matter how bad that was uh, if it didn't happen i would have lost my family i was losing my relationship with my kids mm. my wife i mean I was, I was there, uh, you know, I was never there for them. You know, I thought money cures all problems. I live in a different world, that Trump cult, where power, greed, money, that's all that counts. And, and thank God, like I said, it happened with him. And when it happened, you know, he was able to, it took him a while, you know, my wife, we went through a lot of stuff, me and my family, my other kids, each one of them in their own way. But I'm so proud of all of them because, you know, we got through it and we were able to, you know, get through some really, really hard times, especially with COVID coming around and everything like that. And I'm just proud of my kids, my wife, uh, my family, because I have an incredible support team and I'm never going to let them down again. And I'm going to make them proud, you know. <laughs> so, so Aaron, right, right about right now, Aaron is kind of a big deal on Twitter. Huh? He's a little bit of a heavy hitter. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> He's, they're making memes of his tweets now, so that's when you, that's when you know you've you've arrived. When they start, <laughs> here's a tweet from him saying, "Imagine if the Bengals didn't accept the final score, stormed the field, sued the NFL, and protested the 2022 NFL season, calling it fraudulent." I mean, that's a great analogy, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 he, 
He's uh, he's 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 good. He's incredible. I love him, and God bless him. He has a he has a very good future ahead of him, and you know I'm just a proud dad, and just you know couldn't say more. Now let's let's get it a little bit into um, <laughs> this this story here. Um, you're in a lot of pictures with Donald Trump. I mean, not a lot but like a ton. <laughs> I mean, maybe nobody in history has ever been in more pictures with Donald Trump. And then he said, uh, I don't know him. <laughs> I don't know who he is. <laughs> how, how did that make you feel uh, when you heard him say that? You know, when I first found out, he said that I was in jail. I was actually, I, I, I had no idea. He was saying I had no idea what was going on. Uh, I heard it through other either guards or prisoners that were talking about it and making fun of the situation. And I didn't realize what was going on, but I waited until uh, my attorneys came to visit me. And one of them was Downing, who was Trump's attorney. And Trump told him to be my attorney. And he came into my, we were in the cell, not in the cell, I came into this room. I remember I was all shackled up and, He's sitting there, he looks at me, and he's this like ex-Marine sergeant type and looks at me and says, listen up, you better shut up and take your medicine and do what we tell you mm. to do. Mm. I looked at him, I said, I don't think you you know who you talk, you, you're you talking to the wrong person, you know. <laughs> I said, I don't mm -hmm. know what you're saying here right now, but uh, what is going on? Because, you know, I always thought that I'm saving our democracy. I always, you know, I was really, you know, and I'm, I hate to admit it, but I really believed into their bullshit, excuse me for my language, but mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there is a deep state that, you know, the Clintons and all of this garbage, you know, and I just really, you know, really believed it. I was always talking about getting a Medal of Honor, you know, that I was going to get, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he's going to give me a, a medal at the White House. I mean, it was like, I was really believed I was saving our democracy. So I couldn't believe that we're doing something wrong. I'm sitting here in jail thinking, where's the cavalry? Where's Rudy? Where's, where, you know, where's Bill Barr? You know, <laughs> what's going on? And then Did you feel guy, like they had kind of abandoned you? I don't think, it's not the point they abandoned me. I mean, that's just who they are. I mean, they, they, they abandoned their own mother. They, it's not about, you know, it's a, that's their plan. That's how they live their life until you're useful. I just never knew it because I don't come from their world. I was never involved in politics. I, I grew up in Brooklyn. I never voted. That was my first time I ever voted. So, I mean, mm -hmm. like, I never knew how, you know, I heard stories that politics are worse than the mob and thought that, you know, that's just like a saying, but, you know, it's a true saying. Sayings don't just come about. I mean, yeah. there's no loyalty. There's no, I mean, they look at you on one side and they stab you in the back on the other side. So, again, to me, again, it wasn't about that because I wasn't going into anything thinking that we're doing something wrong. And now I felt they're backstabbing me. I thought we're saving the country, we're doing something right. So even at that point, I couldn't, I was confused. I couldn't understand because here I am, I'm the one that has all this information. Why don't you want me to go in front of Congress and testify? Why are you trying to shut me up? Like what mm -hmm. is going on? And that was what my whole, you know, I was confused. But when he came in and I, I literally lunged at him and they had to pull me out of there and I fired my lawyers in jail. Uh, literally, I told him to get the hell out of there, and, and I got rid of him, and with the God's grace, I was able to find Joe Bondi, who I knew previously from other stuff, and was able to get in touch with him and have him, because I don't think anybody else that didn't know me would have been able to even represent, because the way the media, the way everybody made it seem like, you know, that I was some kind of Russian spy, that I came in here and I infiltrated Rudy and Trump, and I was doing all this garbage, and it was far from the truth, because I was, you know, I'm a Brooklyn boy, I'm an American, I, I was doing this thinking, I'm saving the country, you know, was I wrong? Absolutely, and you know, but I wasn't wrong because it was my intentions or something I came up with. I was wrong because I trusted and believed in and I thought the president could do no wrong. You know, to me, that was the higher power. Do I know different now? Do I know uh, uh, presidents are human beings also? Absolutely. So, you know, lesson learned and move on. So, and I learned that, thank God, you know, quite quickly. And, uh, and I was able to, you know, thank God, help with the impeachment trial and help with whatever I could, you know, uh, or, uh, when I was able to, yeah. You were really, uh, really enthralled with uh, with with Donald Trump. What was it about Donald Trump that sold you on his on on him? I mean, I'm sure 
by that point, you had heard plenty of criticism about him, but you're like, you know what? You guys are wrong. He's right. What What was it about you that that bought your loyalty uh, for Donald Trump? It wasn't so much about that he's right, uh, because there was plenty of times, as, as I said in previous interviews, I mean, uh, his own people uh, would laugh in, in, in his, behind his back and think he's crazy and disagree with the shit that he would say or do. So it wasn't about him being right. It was more about him being, you know, again, not knowing politics, not understanding the left, the right, and how the, the history behind it. I looked at him as a savior. I looked at him as coming in as a regular guy like myself, a businessman. You know, you keep in mind, I used to work for his dad back in Brooklyn selling, uh, you know, uh, co-ops in Brighton Beach. So, you know, I looked at him as like a regular guy and here he is now it's like me being all of a sudden he's trying to not play games with the politicians but he's going to do the right thing and, and they don't like it and the more the democrats pushed against him and even the republicans you know he went against everybody that's what made it even more uh, you know appealing to me thinking look he's not on one side or the other until obviously he won which he never expected to win and then when he won then you know he you know, obviously turned into a total monster and, uh, you know, when he got the power, he just basically, uh, see, uh, you know, he, growing up in uh, Brooklyn, New York, you know, you, you, you have, you look at other things differently. And, you know, Trump grew up in New York. You don't have to grow up in Brooklyn, but he grew up in, in a time and a place where, you know, you, you, you know, he was in real estate. You don't just build those buildings without being involved with certain shady characters, mm -hmm. especially in the Italian world. You know what I'm saying to you? Like he yeah. definitely was involved with guys like Sammy the Bull, Gravano, and God and Gabby and so on back in the days. Because you can't, they, they were involved in everything that happened and in constructions and every, you know, windows and everything that happened in the city. So Trump always looked at people like that differently higher up than he did, did with uh, regular people. So he gave them more respect. And that's why he looks at guys like Putin, like guys like Kim Jong-un, you know, differently than he looks at other presidents. And that's why he has a different respect for them and different understanding. He feels like he's one of those like authoritarian mobster types, if you understand what I'm saying to you. Yep. So what do you, what do you think of him now? Now that, you know, the veil has been lifted. No, uh, I, for a while, I mean, I scream at the top of my lungs and I'll keep screaming and I'll keep, you know, going on there and I hope one day, you know, I'll be able to testify in front of Congress eventually and under oath and get the whole truth out there because I think, you know, uh, a lot of stuff, you know, I still don't understand why you know, certain people don't want my testimony under oath to be able to get the truth out, but uh, hopefully one day it'll come. But uh, a lot of things happen behind the scenes and not just with Trump, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about people like Devin Nunez, Kevin McCarthy, Lindsey Graham, Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson, I mean, a bunch of attorneys. I mean, the insurrection that happened January 6th, it would never have happened if they would have taken a look at what happened during the impeachment, first impeachment with Ukraine, because all that stuff was going on back then, even worse. So, you know, because they got away with all of that, that's why they were able to then, you know, do what they were doing January 6th. Is there any evidence that you provided authorities that you think should have should have really done the job like that should have put him away you know i can't go into what evidence i provided or what you know my opinion is i'll just tell you my opinion you know, my evidence or other evidence i think i think he should have gone away a long time ago i think uh, there's plenty of agencies out there that have enough information uh, to mm -hmm. put him away and i'm still dumbfounded how he's still able to run and spew the garbage that he does, especially during the war that's going on with Ukraine, you know, talking about how he thinks that, you know, Putin is a, you know, a genius. I mean, give me a break. I mean, yeah, free speech is one thing, but this is, you know, you're the ex-president of the United States of America to sit there during world, you know, a war that's going on, that people are getting killed every day and you go out and stay that type of garbage. So, yeah, so I, I, I'm dumbfounded. And I think, uh, Lots of different authorities and lots of different agencies have enough information. I'm just hoping that that day comes sooner than later. You, you spent a lot of time in the that Trumpian orbit, you know, with not just with with Trump and Rudy, but like a lot of the the, the people in that orbit. I just want to ask you about what's the deal with Don Jr. Is, is he on <laughs> drugs? 
I mean, <laughs> he's, he's hey, look, I, look, I'm going to say it to you this. I've never seen him do drugs, but his behavior is off the wall. You know, I mean, he drinks a lot. I've seen him drink a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes his behavior, you know, would lead you to say that he has to be <laughs> doing something. But I personally have not seen him do drugs, but he uh, he was always off the wall, even when we were around, but not like he has gone lately. I mean, I think especially after uh, Trump got off Twitter, I think he's become even uh, crazier on there. I mean, the things that come out of his mouth are just like dumbfounded. I just wonder why, why isn't anyone in that family stepping in, you know, for an intervention? I mean, look, I, Nobody I can cares speak. About him. <laughs> what? Nobody cares about them. <laughs> now, are you say, you're saying that as an observation or do you know, like, no, I, I know he's on his own. He's he's. I mean, Eric does his own thing. Ivanka and Jared have nothing to do with either one of them, and uh, he just runs around. Look, I know there's a lot of rumors out there that he, you know, Trump doesn't love him. He tries to be. I mean, in all reality, from my observation, it's true. Mm. I mean, uh, Trump treats him differently than he treats any other of his kids. You know, what I'm saying whenever we were all together, Ivanka would be in first place, Eric and UC second, and Don Jr. running around like he's a little clown out there. You know, what? <laughs> wait. So Eric is ahead of Don Jr. in the pecking order. If you could believe that, yeah. Damn. That, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Damn. So I, so, uh, that, that's what you see him so hard on Twitter out there trying to, like, you know, he keeps track. He thinks he's going to get that one tweet that, you know, you'll get the approval from that. <laughs> I, I challenged him plenty of times. I said, you know, every time you or Candace Owen open your mouth about Ukraine, why don't you let's do a live uh, debate. I taught you about Ukraine. I told him that, uh, Bupkis, nothing. He won't even respond. Really? I'll tell you one thing. Just, you know, Trump and that whole family, they don't take shit from no, excuse me, from nobody, right? You take can say look, shit. Just, you can yeah, say they, that. They've never responded to one of my tweets. Never. Interesting. Rudy Giuliani blocked me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want well, speaking. They don't want the truth to come out. I challenge them anytime, you know, any one of those Trumps. God bless, you know, if they, they don't know me so well, you know, why don't they get up there and, and prove it and, you know, discuss it? Le- Lev, speaking of Rudy Giuliani, I got to ask you, uh, what, you know, what happened to your boy, man? You know, it's like when you stopped hanging out with the guy, he falls apart. You well, know, okay. if he's not, you know, if, if he doesn't have stuff dripping down his face, he's doing the four seasons total landscaping, you know, he's tucking himself on camera, he's giving COVID farts, he's shaving in the airport. He never did any of these things. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember seeing that shit when you were, you know, you know what I mean? I think that I feel like there's a correlation because there's a whole shit ton of pictures with you and Rudy hanging out together, hanging seriously until until that thing happened and then you guys were on separate so what what's what's going on with him is why isn't he able to function like a regular human being well you know i think uh you know, he, he even when i was around i mean we had a special relationship he had a very respect for him i grew up respecting elders respecting people of power and you know and when you have some respect you know you show respect and mm-hmm. Rudy and his crowd didn't have too much of that, you know, and, you know, people, you know, treated him the way, you know, he was on his own kind of thing. And uh, he already around me started getting crazy, like with the butt dials. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I turned that phone off or I took it away from <laughs> him or I caught it in time or it just, uh, you know, so, I mean, certain stuff were already going on. But uh, the one thing he had is, you know, I thought, you know, that we had, like, you know, a, a loyalty, a trust that, you know, that I, because, you know, I put my life, my life on the line for these guys, you know, mm-hmm. I went to Ukraine to, to you know, uh, to discuss things with people that I had no business being there. The only reason is because, you know, this is the president of the United States and, you know, his lawyer telling me that, you know, I'm saving the country and it's important. So, you know, if I had an extreme trust and, you know, at one point he was, you know, uh, I thought like family to me, he was even godfather to my uh, three-year-old. You know, he was mm-hmm. there, you know, at the breast, he held him when he was, so uh, I, the, out of everybody there, the, the one person that hurt me the most was Rudy, because I really thought that, you know, 
because I knew Trump had his own, you know, Trump had, didn't like Rudy that much. He had his own problems with Rudy. They had a love-hate relationship, which you know, I'm not going to get into right now, but one day I will, you know, for the world to know. So it wasn't, you know, Rudy had his own relationship with the son, and, you know, Andrew, I mean, that's a totally different relationship. And then he had his relationship with his inner crew that were, you know, really, you know, people around him that were uh, trying to feed off of him for many years. And then when he went on the Trump bandwagon and lost all the mid contracts, they started, you know, walking away from him because they were all like, you screwed us. We were around you for 30 years. And now when it's time to get paid off of you, you know, you went ahead with Trump, lost the big contracts. And now, you know, and Rudy's whole thing was he wanted to be Secretary of State. He really wanted to be Secretary of State. And Trump wanted to be and to be AG, and he offered in twice to Rudy turn it down, and he could never forgive. Trump could never forgive him for turning down the AG. He blamed him because he had to give it to Sessions afterwards. And Rudy became basically your uh, uh, de facto Secretary of State because he he thought Pompeo, Pompeo was an idiot, and he basically was going to do he and he ended up being you know dealing with Venezuela, dealing with Ukraine, dealing with you know yeah. all of, all over Europe. I mean, so you know. But this he, must I, have been. I gotta say, this must have been a very wild ride for you oh, personally, yeah. like because yeah. you're behind the scenes. From some crazy shit going on. Crazy shit. I mean, we never even got into I mean, I was with them through the whole Mueller investigation. I sat in on all the... I was, at one point, they said I was part of the legal team. I sat in with him, Sokolo, and everybody listening to all the stuff that was going on. I mean... You don't have any legal I'm training? I'm not going to get into a lot of stuff that will come out soon, but I'm just going to tell you, yeah, I, it was a beyond, you know, to this day, like I sit every day and I... You know, I write my memoirs and I just sit there and I think about day by day the things that happen. It's just, it's not even real. I mean, you know, uh, it's, I can't even believe, you know, uh, all that things that transpired. Uh, and But uh, one thing I'm going to say is I think uh, when, after our arrest and uh, Rudy definitely went off the wild end. So I think, think, because, oh, sorry. yeah, no, because, you know, watching those videos and seeing him deal with certain people that, you have to understand, two of those people, Russian agents, were trying to get a hold of them even before our arrest, but I blocked it twice. Mm. So Rudy knew who they were before he even legged their coach and to Lajenko. And so when I saw that video of him flying to and with a, a, whatever that AON or AO, whatever that's whatever the station is, to do that mm -hmm. interview, especially of Lutsenko, I was like, because because that's I knew then he, he was I mean he was like full of shit he's ready to take garbage from anyone because you know he knew these people were lying to him he knew these people were Russian agents and he went ahead and you know dealt with them anyway and it was and that was and then to watch the whole Fox machine Hannity and all of them was just do you think there's any chance he flips on Trump no no he oh. will happily roll himself under the bus for Trump oh yeah. Yeah, that's why I laugh when I see these news reports. Oh, Rudy gave his phones, and you know now he's going to flip on Trump, and it's never happening. Why I'm so I'm, why so why are you so convinced that he will never flip on Trump? In your has, opinion, well, uh, first of all, he has nothing left already. I mean, uh, he flips on Trump. He's a man, but because he's never going to get uh, any kind of love from anybody from the left. He can forget. I don't care even what he does. There's, you know, he he's too far deep and. Second of all, uh, he strongly believes in that. I mean, Rudy really believes that Biden is a crook. Rudy strongly believes that these Democrats, I mean, unless he was just one of a great guru also, but part of the brainwashing that I went through is because of, you know, no, you guys understand, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s, and I saw Rudy as the head, uh, you know, not only the person putting away all these criminals, but also Rudy becoming the mayor. And so Rudy, like him or hate him, he was, in my eyes, and, you know, he ran for president also, so he was somebody very respectable and very powerful. So uh, when he would turn around and say, this is, you know, a fact, I mean, I took it as fact. I mean, like, you know, who else could, you know, like, it's, who, who, who's, how do you de debate that? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is the man that <laughs> is the top legal, you know, person yeah. in the country. Like, so, you know, so. A lot of it had to do with that. So, but then watching him go off the wall with the insurrection, and then I mean, after my arrest, watching the wheels come off his 
uh, with the Ukrainian stuff and then then the false, uh, uh, you know, uh, alarm because I mean, all these characters like the Degenova crew, you know, Tons in Degenova, I mean, I was, I know them very well, I was with them. I mean, that's all part of his crew uh, and watching them represent, it was just, it was just sad to watch that for our country. And I was very disappointed myself that I was able to get shenanigans, but so I know I still to this day can't believe, you know, because I consider, you know, I watch these movies about cults and I think mm -hmm. you have to, something has to be wrong with you to be able to get into a cult. You have to be missing something. But yeah. here I was in a cult and, you know, it's not about you missing something. It's about them finding something in you that the button to press. And in me, it was the, probably, you know, my whole life growing up, chasing the power, chasing all that, uh, you know, the strength, the power, money. And here I am, I got the president of the United States and his lawyer is my friend and all these congressmen, senators. It just, that I think was my button that, you know, I thought I was, in a, I graduated. I got into a world, you know, God bless me. I got into a world where a kid from Berkeley could never reach, you know, without an education, everything, you know, I didn't realize I was being used by some of the most powerful people in the world to, for their agenda and their, you know, benefit. You had the all access backstage pass. <laughs> Right. And then so. <laughs> um, so you you recently pled guilty to wire fraud uh, conspiracy charge uh, related to your work with the company Fraud Guarantee, um, for which you hired uh, Rudy as a pitch man. Uh, I'm just curious. The name of this the, this has always bugged me since I first heard of this story. I, I think you know where I'm going with this. The name of the company. Is fraud guarantee, my dude? Why, <laughs> why, what, why, why fraud guarantee? Because it almost like you know it, the name. It's almost inviting you to distrust. <laughs> to well, well, you, you have to you have to keep in mind when, when the company came about. It was in two thousand eleven, uh, two thousand twelve. Mm. It was right after two thousand eight crash when we had all. And uh, it also was after I got uh, uh, screwed, basically defrauded in a real estate deal. And uh, one day me and my partner, David Curry, were sitting in my backyard and we came up with the idea of having some sort of an insurance to protect an investor against fraud. You know, we used to call it the anti-Bernie Madoff, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, policy. Uh, the idea was great and the name came up. I actually came up with the name because uh, uh, we, we were looking for a name where like uh, never fraud or something, but they, you, they were all taken and we didn't have the money and the, this was the only one that was available. So it was like catchy enough that we figured that people would click on it because it, and look at it. And once we got them on it, they would see it. And uh, yeah. the fraud guarantee was that thing if, that if you saw on Google, I'm sure you'd click on it and then you would see that it's actually an insurance and, and it was supposed to be guarantee against fraud. <laughs> no, because because our, our motto was you know if no you were just threw the word anti <laughs> in front of fraud that would have been perfect no. if you remember you know american express never leave home without it yeah well our motto was never invest without it for a guarantee uh, never invest without it so yeah i mean the idea was great and uh you know unfortunately um uh, I did some wrong things uh, uh, to, to to try to do it, which is totally wrong, and, and that I don't justify it, you know, in mm -hmm. any way. And and uh, I take full responsibility for whatever wrong I did, and you know, it's my time to make it right to the people I did wrong by and move on from that. And um, that's all I can say about that at the time. But uh, I'm not really not done with that because he 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 stole five hundred thousand dollars, and you know. <laughs> So we'll get to that also. <laughs> yeah, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy's, uh, it's just funny how things play out, you know, but we'll see what happens. Mm. Um, I, I want to back back up a little bit to um, the, the day you were arrested. Had you ever been arrested before this? Never in my life. That was your first time? Absolutely, yeah. What what was that like? Was it was it? Did you even know what was going on? Did you see it unfolding slowly, or did they completely take you by surprise? Uh, it was it was surreal. I mean, we were on our, we were sitting at the airport for two and a half hours in the VIP lounge, 
we were escorted there by uh, uh, security that Rudy arranged, uh, private police security. So we're sitting what? there. What? Yeah, I mean, it was just, I was with Rudy for the whole day at the Trump International. He was supposed to be on the flight with me. He was flying with me. He was supposed to be on the flight with me and he canceled at the last second. He said that he'll meet me the next day. Uh, mm. so set up. I was setting up an interview for Sean Hannity, which uh, he also, uh, you know, pretends he doesn't know what's going on. Everybody also <laughs> got amnesia. It's, it's, it's hilarious. So I'm, you know, and, and, and the crazy part is I really didn't want to go that time because it was on Yom Kippur. We just came back from, we were on a month long trip in Vienna. I didn't want to go. And the only reason we were forced to go was because uh, they wanted to do this interview with Victor Shokin at the time that was supposedly drugged somewhere and he was scared for his life and it was the only time we could do it. So mm -hmm. again, I felt like, you know, I got into a fight with my family because <laughs> we had to miss Yom Kippur, which is a very holy holiday, and, you know, but I thought God's going to forgive us because, you know, I'm, you know, uh, we're doing something again that extremely important, time sensitive. So here we are at the, at the, at the airport waiting to load. They say first class time to load. We're going. And we were the last ones in line, me and Igor. And we're like walking through the line. And as soon as all the people, I mean, Igor left, all of a sudden you see like a bunch, like maybe 10, 15 people in front of us. The gates in the background, they're like, your passport, please. Like, you know, I'm like here. And they're like, okay, like that. Okay. Like they didn't know who it was. And then some guy came up and says, can you move over to the side? I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, they grabbed us. And they're like, you got to move over to the side. We moved over. And then I saw they closed the plane door and they're like, uh, you're under arrest. Never read me my Miranda rights. Never told me what I'm being arrested for. Uh, they would put us in a car uh, and then they shut down the airport, drove us across the whole airport outside uh, mm. into some other uh, place uh, where there was about maybe 50, 60 different agents from different agencies, all of them kept us there for a while, booked us, and then they took us to the Virginia County Jail. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And how long were you locked up for before you, they released you? Uh, I ended up being there for two weeks. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. Dude, because I've, look, I've been arrested, you know, a few times, handful, maybe. Uh, small things. I have a past, <laughs> you know. Um, but at the most, I think it was overnight. You know, I spent a, a no. day, but two weeks. No, two weeks, solitary confinement, 23-hour lockdown. I mean, and I went through some shit in there. And Rudy was not able to pull any strings or get you sprung earlier than that, huh? The only thing Rudy did was uh, in the middle of the night, I received the, uh, I was, just so you understand the conditions, I'm sitting in a cell, I don't even have a piece of paper they wouldn't give me, you know, mm. they, they were so strict with me. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, they slipped a postcard underneath my uh, jail cell, <laughs> and it's from Rudy in the White House telling me like, everything's gonna be okay. Don't worry about it, you have good lawyers. Paul Manafort only got seven years. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> that's not, that's, that's not no. reassuring. No, <laughs> I, not I, reassuring. I, got, I, I, was, I was blessed by God himself because the next morning my lawyer came and I was able to give him the postcard. And then they searched my cell the, uh, right after that and couldn't find, I was able to get the postcard out. So I am. Mm. Wow. So let me ask you this. You are, you now consider yourself, well, do you consider yourself uh, a Democrat or a Republican? Where, where do you fall in the political spectrum now? I, I consider myself, I was always in the middle. I'm still in the middle. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not definitely more Democratic than Republican. You know, I grew up, I'm an immigrant that came here that got help. And I believe, you know, I, I believe in helping others, but also I'm, I'm a, uh, conservative on certain sides of the ways I raise my kids. So I'm a, I'm in the middle, not not too far right, not too far left. And I, that's where I believe our country should be because I think going far left or far right gets us in trouble. And mm. that's what happened with the Republicans. We, they went off the charts far right, you know, where, you know, they're dealing with the, you know, the white supremacist now and everything you could imagine. So, yeah. So I, I, I guess you could say independent leaning Democrat. Yeah, yeah I would say that. Absolutely. No, definitely. Not. Definitely. There's no Republican Party now. So there's no there's there's not even. Yes, yeah, so definitely Democrat right now. You know, what happened? What, what happened when you, you know, when you turned your back on Trump? Like, did you get a lot of hate from friends or family or whatever? 
Excuse well, me. Uh, basically, uh, I, when I cut off everything and completely, uh, I cut off all, my whole background off. I, I cut off everything that surrounded my life for the past four years prior to my arrest had to do with Trump. I didn't associate myself with anybody that would even, I was such a hardcore Trumper that, I mean, if you even breathe the wrong way, you couldn't be around me. So, I mean, I, you gotta understand, you couldn't watch Rachel Maddow in my house. I would get, and, and that's one of the reasons why I had her do my first interview was because she was the one I would, I would, we would fight. I would tell my wife, you better not put on Rachel Maddow. And, you know, so I was very hardcore, you know, yeah. so, uh, but after my arrest, uh, the only, I, I went cold turkey on everybody. I've just been with my family. I've been spending time with my kids, my family. I've made new friends, new life. And it's like a new chat, right? I was like reborn again. You know, I cut everything in. And that's the only way I believe in it because if you need to cut out the cancer, you need to just, you know, cut it out. And I cut out all of that. And I surround myself with good people and good stuff now and, you know, positive energy. What news do you watch now? I watch CNN uh, and uh, MSNBC. You know, it's funny. I, I put on Fox just to try to see, but they've gotten so far off the craziness. I can't even watch it for a second. It's just sick. Yeah. I mean, uh, just it's sickening. I mean, I don't know. And to me, it's, uh, I don't know. Was it like that when I was around or wasn't I, I, it's hard to tell because, because when back then I was brainwashed. So I don't know, were they that crazy? Was I just off the rails? Or are they crazier now? Because now it's like, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself before, there's nothing else I can watch but Fox. They've gotten now, crazier. I They've gotten crazier. I can't, crazier. Even, like, I can't. I'm just like off the rails. Lev, uh, we're at the point, uh, part of our show here, where first I want to throw up your, uh, this is your Twitter handle here. This is, folks, um, Lev, at Lev Parnas. P-A-R-N-A-S. This is his Twitter handle. Give him a follow. He's posting some good tweets out there. Uh, and uh, if, in case you can't remember, his hashtag, he uses this hashtag. It's his own unique hashtag, Lev Remembers. Yeah, so if you type that in, you'll, you'll find all of his tweets there. And also, I want to uh, share with you, uh, there's a website that he's got. And I'm going to put it up again later, but this is Ukrainian Festival, <clears throat> excuse me, Ukrainian Festival Orlando.org. And if you want to help, if you want to send donations to help the efforts for the Ukrainian people, go there and that's a, a great place to, uh, to donate. Now, we're at the part of our show that I call Twitter Tips and Tricks. Lev, you have not a small uh, Twitter account is a sig significantly sized. I believe it's at about fifty-seven thousand. Yeah, close to it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, about fifty-seven thousand followers, um, and you've so therefore you've had some success tweeting. I wonder if you can share any tips and tricks with our audience. Some stuff that maybe um, helps them get more engagement, more replies, more retweets, more followers. Uh, Anything that helps them get the message across. What are some things that you do um, that improve your own Twitter experience? Uh, I guess my biggest success that I get is when I call out uh, these imposters or, I mean, these uh, GOP members that spew all this garbage and lies, and I call them out on their lies because I have all the receipts to mm. their lies. So every time, you know, you got Kevin McCarthy or Trump or Junior or somebody coming out and trying to, I try to, you know, call them out on it and try to re retweet there and prove out that they're lying. So that's given me a tremendous success. Um, well, the other thing I would recommend is just, uh, you know, uh, being in the community, liking people, other people's tweets, uh, and they'll like your tweets back, follow people, they'll follow you back. You know, mm. just uh, showing, uh, you know, good respect back and forth. I found that there's a lot of people out there that, that, that will re reciprocate, reciprocate with that. So reciprocal engagement, yeah. yeah, and calling out the other side. I guess you're quote tweeting some of these folks, yeah. Right, you know, obviously because of my background and history with so, with all of these individuals, it's more than just calling them out. I call them out like with facts and truth, and uh, you know, I speak truth to power. That's <laughs> up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I got an interesting one here. Uh, this is a quote tweet, but it's not. Uh, you're not quote tweeting. 
somebody that you're calling out, Aaron Rupar, um, has a lot of informative stuff here. And you're saying Putin's good friend Donald Trump, one, tried to dismantle NATO, two, tried to extort President Zelensky, and three, tried to start an insurrection, and he failed at all three. Hashtag Lev remembers. I brought this here because I also wanted to point out something that you did in this tweet that is very good. It's numbering things. It's numbering. Some of the best tweets that I've had, they use the actual number and list my points in short, punchy uh, statements, short, impactful statements. So this is very good. And also you use the hashtag Lev remembers. Hashtags are very good, You, especially if you create your own uh, unique hashtag. It's a good way to track your own tweets. But also sometimes these things can, um, can go viral. Uh, another one here. This one, uh, you said Trump and Putin subscribe from the same dictator's playbook. Soon as one of your cohorts gets caught, you pretend not to know him. And then again, hashtag Lev remembers. Yeah. That's right. And, and, um, and that's one, if I may, uh, what happened there is uh, uh, Putin uh, had one of his uh, close uh, allies uh, get captured, President Zelensky, and the Ukrainians caught him and uh, offered to trade him in for Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, Zelensky turned around and said, take it back your mangulus, and Putin pretended not to know him, even though right. he's There was that Medvedchuk, right? The Medvedchuk, godfather? Yeah. Yeah, he's godfather to his daughter, and he pretended not to know him. So I don't know, I know. If who. To, yeah, I don't know if it's Trump taking a playbook out of him or he takes a playbook. <laughs> but you could tell the resemblance of the two, to the way the two of them react and react. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so um, next, I want to jump on to uh, the Ukraine, right? Because that, you know. Um, this hits close to your heart. You know, I know you are from Ukraine. Do you do you still have uh, friends and family in Ukraine? Oh, absolutely. I have lots of friends, uh, lots of acquaintances, and I have family there. Um, yeah, I just recently was able to, it took us about a little over three weeks, but I was able to get uh, my cousin's family, his wife and daughter, out of Ukraine with the help of Global Empowerment Mission. Uh, they do a huge humanitarian work down there. Uh, they were able to get them out, and now they're in Austria. Uh, so they were able. To, my cousin, on the other hand, he went back to Kiev, where he's from, and uh, he's helping uh, the, the forces, the ground forces uh, on the ground. Uh, we're getting them supplies uh, through the the charity that I posted. To me, <clears throat> excuse me, Ukrainian festival. Uh, what they're doing is they're basically delivering because. With all the help and all the money that's coming in, uh, most of the money is going in and charity is going to a hub, and then the hub distributes it out to all the, the armies getting it. And but what's happening is a lot of times, the it doesn't get all the way down to the the people on the street, the the civil servants, and so this organization actually is in touch with. Like right now in Odessa, we're in touch with. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to the soldiers out there. Slava Ukrainian Slava is a, is a dear friend of mine. He's uh, second in command to the general, mm. and they're fighting fiercely in Odessa right now. So uh, they're right now in basic need of like pickup trucks, where they transform the truck pickup trucks into military vehicles. And this organization, where they already have isolated 20, 30 pickup trucks in Europe that they're going to purchase and get them over there quickly. Uh, we're getting them uh, helmets, uh, night vision glasses, and stuff like that. So there's different organizations. I mean, if you want to help humanitarian-wise, uh, I would recommend Global Empowerment Mission because uh, they're doing just an incredible job. They're stationed out of Poland. Uh, but if you want to help the soldiers and the people on the ground, uh, the, the charity that I talked about right now, Orlando Festival, is a uh, Ukrainian Festival Orlando project is very important because they're reaching it out to the ground. Now, I, I got to ask you, um, taking into account everything that is hap- currently happening in Ukraine now, um, how do you feel looking back, you know, to the things that you did to help Trump, um, you know, uh, to help him get some leverage against uh, President Zelensky? How, how do you feel uh, about that now? 
Um, I've apologized already to President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine, and I apologize to Maria Ivanovich several times. Um, mm. But you have to understand, and again, it's no excuse, but at that moment, I did not feel that I was only helping President Trump because uh, I didn't think we were doing anything wrong. My understanding was that President Zelensky was uh, a new president that didn't have much experience, that was an active previously. He was at that time connected to Igor Kolomoysky, which was an oligarch, uh, you know, uh, criminal at the time. And he was a new guy. So in my opinion, what we were doing is we were helping him, you know, build a relationship with President Trump. And, you know, at that time, I did not know Trump was a monster. I did not know Trump was going to do bad. So mm -hmm. I thought it would be good for him to be have a relationship because at that time, there, you know, Ukraine had no relationship with the United States uh, because, of, you know, Trump was very upset with them. So looking back at it, I could tell you one thing, thank God that he didn't succumb to the pressure because I could tell you the pressure was very difficult on him. And I know, I thought he would, I don't know how he didn't, but God bless him, God bless Ukraine. And that he, that he stood up to Trump and told him, I'm not gonna do you that favor because I don't know what we would be right now if he did do that. But uh, as things played out, thank God he didn't. Were you surprised that um, President Zelensky was was elected president, especially considering the fact that, you know, he was, as you said, he was a comedian. Well, yeah, that I mean, that's one of the reasons why I felt that, you know, he didn't know what he was doing with all the respect. And again, it wasn't just me feeling that way. It was the, it was a, a, the feeling that we all had it was because mm -hmm. at that point, nobody realizes. But before Zelensky was even in the picture, Trump put the pressure on Poroshenko. I've met with Poroshenko for three and a half hours where, you know, the, telling him he needed to announce it, it all started with Poroshenko. And Trump, uh, uh, Rudy and the crew thought that Poroshenko was uh, going to be the obvious winner. So they, you know, they also had uh, Timoshenko at the time trying to reach out to Rudy and people and, and, and uh, to try to get their support. Uh, but uh, at that, all the uh, prognosis were that it was going to be Poroshenko, and that's why all the conversations with, was with the ex-president Poroshenko. Then miraculously, out of nowhere, you know, like he came out of nowhere, Zelensky all of a sudden jumped out in front. But when he jumped out in front, it was under, you know, not the best of terms, because again, he came out as a comedian that's uh, supposedly supported by a criminal oligarch, that's in, in Ukraine. I mean, that's uh, an excerpt, excerpt in, in Israel right now. So we didn't know anything about him. And that was part of our mission was to get a hold of him and, and, and meet him and introduce him. And unfortunately, other powers were trying to keep us away. And you know where we ended up today, you know, obviously how it happened. But uh, yeah. Have you seen Servant of the People yet? <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it before, yeah. <laughs> That's so I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of season one. It's pretty it's, funny, actually. It's like I, you know, it's like he planned out the future. You couldn't plan it out, right? Incredible. It's crazy. But, but, yeah. But, but that's another thing what people don't understand. That even in this war, and it's hard to believe. But like Putin, he has a personal thing towards Zelensky. It's not just you know the, because a lot of these oligarchs, and this is why it's tough because they used to pay for Zelensky to come and perform for them. And the shows mm -hmm. for them, so they they had these relationships, and now he became president, and they didn't want to give him that respect. I don't think, or that you understand what I'm saying to you is like, yeah. who do you think it, it's like? You know, all of a sudden your waiter becomes the owner of the restaurant, and is like you're like, wait, it's like can you were, you know? So it was kind of uh, I, that's why I give Zelensky a lot of respect. The way you know, uh, I like I said, I didn't know him previously to them. You know, I just know of him. And, but to see the way he stood up uh, to this tyrant and making the right decision to our ex-tyrant, <laughs> Trump, uh, I mean, he's, been, he's done some good decisions. How did it make you feel when, uh, when you heard that Trump described Putin as a genius and that you heard he wouldn't even condemn Vladimir Putin? I wanted to throw up. I mean, it was... Uh, 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 there's no words really to say. I mean, it's just it's just sickening. I mean, uh, that, I started off when we started off the show. I told you. I mean, that's like, I, free speech is one thing, but that's that's not. That's just disgusting. I mean, yeah. it's just 
despicable and, 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 and anybody that supports him after that or I mean they should take a good look in the mirror and think about what the hell are they doing there's so many GOP politicians right now that support Putin um, Sick me. Sick me. what's what's the deal with that I mean I, I can mean, understand before look I can understand before Putin invaded Ukraine Maybe some GOP politicians think it's clever or strategic or whatever. But, you know, how do you continue to support him while these atrocities are being committed? Does he have blackmail on these guys? No, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's like what they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I mean, these guys are from the same cloth uh, or they're blinded by power. Uh, and they, like I said, they'll sell their own mother, they'll sell their own soul. They don't have a soul. They've already sold their souls. So they're basically out there trying to do so. And they believe that he's the one that's going to take him to the promised land. And they're going, and as you can see, I mean, thank God to like a Liz Cheney or, you know, Adam Kissinger, to people like that to stand up to them and say, wait a second, this guy be crazy, you know, we're, this is not normal. So, but uh, the, the rest of them are, I mean, look at Lindsey Graham. I mean, he's a perfect, uh, Kevin McCarthy, Lindsey Graham. I mean, these guys yeah. stood right after the day after the insurrection. They stood up yeah. there and pounded their chest saying, the ride is over. We had mm-hmm. a good ride. It was great while it lasted. But then, and then all of a sudden, two days later, kissed his ass, come back. And now like all of a sudden, hey, you know, you know, I was never involved in politics. I don't think I'll ever be involved in politics again because uh, it's just a, a swamp I don't want to be involved with. But unfortunately, these are people that run our country and it's sickening. Drain the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got into it. <laughs> That's what got me into this. <laughs> All right, Lev, I, I have uh, some questions from our audience, members of our viewers, members of our audience. Uh, they have some questions for you. I'm going to start off with a few that uh, I already have uh, queued up. And one is from Jonathan Slater, who would like to know exactly when and how did the idea of pressuring Ukraine to investigate Joe and or Hunter Biden first arise to your knowledge? When and how? This was uh, about, uh, I think, around November of 2018. Uh, mm-hmm. We were traveling with Rudy, uh, supporting GOP candidates uh, and DeSantis for governor of Florida. And we were having dinner where one of Rudy's investigators from previously uh, uh, came to him and gave him some letter from some Ukrainians uh, to give to Lindsey Graham, talking about uh, that they have stuff on Hunter Biden and so and so on. Uh, and basically at that dinner, uh, we started talking and uh, then Rudy started mentioning names of people and uh, my partner Igor obviously knew a lot of the same people because he's from U- Ukraine and it just uh, one thing led to the other. Next thing you know, Rudy's like, you know, love this, love that, love <laughs> I became like, you know, uh, everything, everybody that called him and then the next thing you know, we're at the uh, Hanukkah party at the White House and uh, we're being sent to Ukraine after that. So it was probably around that time frame. Okay. Uh, My next question is from my wife. (laughs) She she wants to know, uh, was your family disappointed in you when they learned of your involvement with the plan to pressure Zelensky? They were very disappointed and everything that was there. It wasn't more disappointed in what I was actually, because I believed I was, like I said, doing the right thing. So my family knew that I wasn't, it wasn't that I was pressuring him with an intention to hurt him or Ukraine and that, because even if you ever listen to my uh, taped conversation when we, we had dinner with Trump, I was against Russia. I was always for Ukraine, against Russia. So my, I was, I was always trying to build a building block between Ukraine and the uh, uh, United States. I always wanted to do business in Ukraine. So it wasn't, I was never pressuring Ukraine to hurt Ukraine. I thought that Zelensky was just not knowledgeable enough and needed to get that extra push to have the relationship with Trump. And that's where my mistake came in. I think my family was more disappointed in me that I cut off uh, basically their free speech in the household. Uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't allow anybody to talk uh, their opinion. Like my son Aaron was, I mean, he would sit there quiet and not even talk about anything during dinner times and stuff like that. 
my wife uh, wasn't able to have friends. She wanted to have friends. She got uh, also isolated in, in, in the, just the Trump world and going to Trump events and being with Trump people. And, and eventually, you know, you get to that point where it was, it was a pretty disgusting situation where I forced it upon everybody and thinking mm. you should be happy because we're going to Mar-a-Lago, we're going to all these VIP events behind the scenes, all super duper. People can only dream of private jets and they weren't happy with that because- They didn't they, care about the private jets. They didn't care about that. No, they wanted, they wanted to be them. They wanted me to be me. They wanted me, you know, because, you know, they, you know, especially there was one actual, I remember that point, you know, that, and I still can't get over it because it's not me. And I, it was when Trump made fun of the, the remember he made fun of the uh the uh, the reporter that had uh either epilepsy or i'm not sure that he was he had uh some sort of sickness and yeah. he made fun of him came out like that and i couldn't have you know for maybe a week or that i couldn't even you know look at trump or you know I, it, that took me a long time for me to like fight myself and i still can't forgive myself for making myself do but it was like circumstances like that that my family was disappointed in me because they knew that was not me i always taught them differently and here i was supporting you know a jackass that is out there doing such sick things and and that was the biggest disappointment well lev look i am not going to sit here and and browbeat you over that you know um i'm going to tell you exactly i, I had joe walsh on the show and you know joe walsh is similar you know he was walking down that path too and then he realized oh shit um i've done fucked up <laughs> and now he's doing everything he can to help undo the damage he had wrought and i'm sure you were beating yourself up over this probably more worse than anybody else could beat you up i, I still do i still do and i will you know and I'm still, you know, like you said, I'm going to keep doing right. I'm going to keep trying to be positive, trying to get the truth out. I'm working on making sure that the truth gets out and people get held accountable for what they did. And hopefully they do. And uh, that's the only thing I could do is just make right and be a better person. So can we count on you to vote blue in November? Absolutely. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, I, 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 the, the second time I voted... The first time I was the second time I was for Joe Biden. <laughs> oh, okay. Good job. Very good. All right. Um, we are now, Lev, at the part of the show. It's my favorite part of the show. It is the guessing game part of the show. So how this works is that I'm going to give you a choice of one of three different categories. All right. We have name that 80s tune. Two, we have name that Billy Joel song. And then three, we have name that TV show theme song. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not great with music. Uh, I'm going to have to go with name that TV theme song. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> no, I, okay. So how this works is, especially for the TV shows, uh, not all of them have... Um, lyrics. Some of them are just, you know, um, some of them are just music. And so I will hum or sing the lyrics or music to these these uh, things. And if you guess correctly, then you get this look of approval here. If <laughs> if you guess incorrectly, then you get this look of disapproval here. Right. Okay, so are you ready for our first one? Let's do it. Okay, here's the first one. Dun 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 you are correct, sir. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Boom. The first one is the A-Team. Good job, my friend. And uh, we'll give you SpongeBob for that one. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, that one was an, was an easy one. Let's see if, uh, hang on. What's the next one here? 
Okay. All right. Let me get my uh, lyric sheet here. Here's the next one. I bet we've been together for a million years. And I bet we'll be together for a million more. Oh, it's like I started breathing on the night we kissed. And I can't remember what I've ever did before. What do we do, baby, without a... Nothing. Uh, what do we do, baby, without us? Uh, no. You got me stuck, though. Uh, All right. Multiple choice? <laughs> <laughs> I the, <laughs> the answer we were looking for was family, family ties. ties. Yes, okay. Yeah, but you didn't guess, so unfortunately, we're going to have to give you this look of disapproval here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Family Ties, a uh, famous show starring... Um, was Michael J. Fox yeah. as Alex P. Ke Keaton. Alex Keaton, that's right. That's right. Okay, so let's see what's our next one. Okay, the next one. Are you ready? I'm ready. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I know this. Dun, 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 it's a great theme song, huh? All right, so who do we got here? We got, yeah, there's Leonardo giving you the point, the finger point of approval there. Good job, my friend. All right, so let's go. Let's see what's... You're doing well so far. I'm going to tell you um, not to feel bad about the Family Ties one because Malcolm Nance was unable to guess that one correctly oh, okay. either. Yeah? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, here's the next one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Shlemiel, Shlemazel. Haas and Pfeffer uh, Incorporated. So <laughs> We're going to do it. <laughs> Laverne and Shirley. Yeah, that's my yeah. I got to stop doing the count thing. <laughs> People get it right away when I do the count. He said Shlemiel Shlemazel was over with. Okay. What does Shlemiel Shlemazel mean anyway? Do you have any idea? It's like, does that mean uh, something? It's, it's like, it's like somebody that's not, you know, like, you know, that constantly. Like, a schlemiel is a, is a knucklehead, right? Like a knucklehead, yeah. Like somebody that's like all over the place. like <laughs> Almost like a schmuck. A schmuck, yeah. Like, that's exactly right. So, <laughs> uh, I, I know. Somebody that's not lucky. That's, that, oh, really? That, that that's, feels like a schmuck because he just doesn't have luck. I so, did not know so, that. Yeah, They're both schmucks, but the one is doing it on purpose. One is, uh, doesn't have the luck for it, kind of. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> one of our viewers is saying it's like Trump. At least the straw is saying <laughs> Trump is a schlamazel. <laughs> but I don't know. I'd have to debate that because he seems so far, it seems to be like Teflon. Hmm. Yeah. You know what? Last time I heard the Teflon uh, and he didn't end up too well. So hopefully this one. Get, goes the same way as the other Teflon did. You may have a point there. Teflon All eventually right, rips. You know, it does, it's not lo uh, everlasting. <laughs> okay. Let's do our next one. You ready? Yep. Who can turn the world on with a smile? Who can take a nothing day and suddenly make it all seem worthwhile? Well, it's you, girl, and you should know it. With each glance and every little movement, you show it. Nothing yet? Nothing. Love is all around, no need to waste it. You can have the town, why don't you take it? You're gonna make it after all. You're gonna make it after all. Mary Morshaw? What's that? Mary Morshaw? 
Ooh, you're so close. I'm going to give it to you. Uh. It's. We were looking for Mary Tyler Moore. Oh, 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 Mary, Mary Tyler, Tyler, Tyler Moore. Moore. Yeah, but man. very good. Very good. Uh, we got some folks. Um, the whole audience is is guessing, by the way. This is Cindy Z. She's this Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. So yeah, we'll give you we'll we'll give you the approval there because you did you did get it. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you missed the, the middle name there. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh hang on, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. You ready? They're creepy and they're kooky. Mysterious uh, and spooky. They're all together family. hooky. Adam's what? Family. Yeah, this family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Let's see. Let's see. Who are you getting now? We'll give you, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll give you. Uh, uh, Drake is approving of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go back here. Okay, and here is the final one. Look at what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm up on top of the world. Should have been somebody else. I know this. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Never thought I should be so free. Oh my god, I just flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? Oh, oh my God, I know it. Believe oh. it or not, it's just me. Uh, uh, uh. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, nah, oh, I'm going to say nothing. I know the song, it's like... But, okay, we were looking America, for yes. greatest American, American hero. hero. Yeah, that was <laughs> such a deep, I mean, I, knew, I, I saw it in front of me, but I just couldn't. <laughs> Let's see. And uh, what what kind of look are we getting now? You, you're getting this one here. Yeah, she's not she's not happy with you. But hey, don't sweat it. You did all right. You got um, I think you got three or four of these, so that's not so bad. Good job. All right, so we are now at the uh, final part of the show where um, this is kind of a rapid fire bit. And where was I here? Da, 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 da. Hold on. Where is it? Ah, okay. This is called My Favorite Things. There are no wrong answers to this except maybe for one. Or two. <laughs> I'm basically I'm gonna ask you what are your favorite what are your favorite things? And uh it's rapid fire, so just whatever, you know, whatever's clever. Are you ready? Let's do it. Favorite TV show to binge watch. Oh, to binge watch so many of them. Uh I'm gonna have to say uh <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna say uh, Breaking Bad. Ooh, you know what? I was totally in my brain thinking Breaking Bad. That is an excellent show to binge watch. Favorite kids' breakfast cereal. So, when you were a kid, this was your favorite breakfast cereal? Uh, Krispy Kreme, uh, not Krispy <laughs> chocolate, uh, the Krispy uh, cereal. Uh, Cocoa Frost Crisp? Cream. Frosted Flakes. Frosted Flakes. Okay. Favorite action movie. Favorite action movie. Uh, action movie. <laughs> so I'm so bad with names. Like I got so many movies. 
mm-hmm. of action movies. Uh, let's go with. I'm gonna go with the old war. This is all the warriors. Wait, the warriors, warriors, yeah, come, come out, out and play. And play. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, you went way back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Favorite Ukrainian dish, food. Maybe Ukrainian dish. Uh, it would have to be haladets. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, Jello and ch- uh, like frozen Jello, and there's chicken inside and meat, and it's like a frozen dish, and it's like uh, awesome. Interesting. I'm going to have to try that. Any idea where where I could find that in Brooklyn? Brighton Beach. <laughs> Brighton Beach. Okay, so I'm going to have to replay. You can text me the name of this. You're yeah, going to text me. it to me. Call me All when right. you're at any Russian store. Or, you know, I'll let you know. <laughs> favorite baseball player? Oh, favorite baseball player. I'd say my time was uh, Don Manning. Mattingly. Good choice. Good Sorry, choice. He's a Yankee. He's my boy. Favorite Coney Island ride. There's really only one correct oh, answer. Cycle. There you go. <laughs> that is the correct answer. If you said anything else, I would have said. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite Twitter account. Favorite to uh, Brooklyn Dad. <laughs> yeah. Aside from me, aside from me, uh, favorite Twitter account. I'd have to say my son, I'm my son Aaron Farnes. <laughs> That's a great account. You couldn't go wrong with there. Um, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts for coffee? Uh, Starbucks. Okay, okay. Um, private jet or yacht? Private jet. Have oh, you been on a yacht before? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. I mean, yeah. like some of them that they're taking away right now. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> okay. I'm gonna have some serious uh, private yachts. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Okay, but you prefer the private jet? To yeah, me. I'm more because uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I, it gets you from play. I, I like. I, I hate going to airports and going through all of that. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Pizza or burgers? Mm. Oof. I got to go with pizza. I'm a I'm a, my New York pizza. I got to go with pizza. Yeah. Pizza. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, how's the pizza down in Florida? The water's no good. I mean, it's like they can't get the water. The bagels, the pizza, the dough, it's, 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 it's not the same. You have some places where they're trying to filter the water somehow, but you can't still... New York is New York. Interesting. So the fact that they can't get the water right in Florida, it affects the quality of the pizza. And the bagels. I didn't know that. That's clever. Okay. Cats or dogs? Dogs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love my cat. So we have two cats. I love cats also. Don't get me wrong. We have two cats and a dog. And like at nighttime, I'm like a a caretaker, you know, with both the cats and the dog. I put the dog, I tuck her in at night, you know. (laughs) Uh, Okay. If you could live anywhere on the planet, where would that be? Where I am now, Florida. (laughs) I love it here. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, If you could do any job for one day, what would that be? Any job for a while. After all of this, I figure I'll never do any job. (laughs) But uh, for one day, I'd love to manage a football team. I mean, own a football team or like a... Which football team? the New York Jets, obviously. I dreamed of buying the Jets. Oh. But I met Woody. I, I met Woody a couple of times, and I abused the hell. I said, "You guys, you can't get a winner. I said, get, get me on there. I'll get you. Show you how to win. You know. Yeah, I've been a diehard Jet fan for over thirty years. So yeah. You're a masochist. <laughs> Tell me. Oh my God! Because you could. This could be any team. You could have picked a, a Super Bowl winner, yeah. but you picked the Jets. You know, You're like going to make underdog. some serious moves, huh? I like the underdog, dog. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. there, you know, 
it's just there, everybody needs a chance. Everybody needs a, a chance of getting there. How many years away? Because oh, look, look, don't get me wrong. I'm me myself personally. I am a New York fan, so I root for primarily the Yankees, but I also root for the Mets. I don't hate on the Mets right. just because right. we're Absolutely. supposed to hate each other. I don't buy that shit. Right. Um, the Knicks over the Nets, you know, although I do root for the Nets too. The Knicks suck ass, but whatever. <laughs> I do root for both of them, but the Jets, um, how many years away do you think before they got something, you know, playoff team? Huh. You don't want to ask me because every year I say this is our year. So. <laughs> <laughs> my wife laughs at me. My kids, Tammy and I, have, no. But uh, I mean, if I would have to uh, think about, I think we're, we're we're a couple of years. I mean, we're we're maybe a year or two away from me. You never know because uh, you got Wilson his second year coming in, and then uh, I know they're making some moves. They got a couple of first round picks, you know, probably go get a good wide receiver. They're building their uh, you know, offensive line. Uh, you know, I think we have a good uh, coach finally and a good GM. So we'll see. I think, you know, another year or two, I think we might get uh, I think we're definitely going to start getting competitive starting next year. And you never know. Football takes us that, you know, one game any, on any given Sunday, anybody can win. So, you know. I was I was a Jets fan from the time Richard Todd was the quarterback. Oh, yeah. Richard no, I was, Todd. I was before Todd. Remember Freeman McNeil? Of course. Kenny the New York Sack Al Exchange. Al yeah. Toon. Remember Al Toon? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wayne Corbett. Everybody. I remember when Wayne Corbett walked on. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Gaston O'Cleco, the sack machine. That's right. You remember that? Yeah. Those are the days. So, yeah. Okay. So, here's the last question here. Any particular charities or fund? Oh, I already know the charity or foundation that you are. Am I right? Yes. Is it Ukrainian Festival Orlando dot org? Yeah, Ukrainian Festival Orlando dot org is doing extreme work right now on the ground in Ukraine, helping out uh, the fight against the Russians right now. Absolutely. This is a great cause. No, it's so a great guys? cause, uh, and and it's direct. I mean, they're getting it directly into the hands and making sure that every dollar counts and goes to them. Excellent. Listen, Lev, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the show here. As I said earlier, it's not easy. It's it's not easy to, you know, to admit that you have gone wrong and you have done so in a in a very public way. Yeah, you know. You've gone on TV. I'm not even talking about this show, this little tiny little show. I'm talking about you've been on with Rachel Maddow, you know, and Anderson Cooper. I went on all of them. Ali Vashi. Yeah. You name it. You know, and I will and I'll keep going and I'll keep making sure the truth gets out and you know, trying to, you know, live a positive life and do right from now on and, you know, just enjoy my life and you know, do good. Indeed. So uh, once again, thank you. Thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, good luck to you. I know you've got some legal issues down the road. Uh, we'll be praying for you and we'll thank be you. praying for your your fellow countrymen and women in thank Ukraine you so for, you know, um, I don't know how how that situation is going to shake out, but I, I hope it I hope it doesn't last years. People are talking years and I really don't even Want it to last months either, but you you know your fellow countrymen are are holding their own. They're standing up to Putin. I'll tell you, it's it's a terrible atrocities that's happening. But I want to give all the glory, all the power to all the individuals, the 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 army, the police, the the regular men out there, women that are picked up grounds and are defending our homeland and not allowing because they're fighting not just for themselves, but they're fighting for the, the whole world. They're on the front line because this is a, a, a monster that, you know, will go further and will continue. And I want to thank, you know, President Biden and all of the help that America has given to the Ukrainian because, I mean, I think it's close to $3 billion worth of support already. I mean, it's not, never have they received them. The more yeah. we, we need to keep giving and helping. And uh, I think, you know, even though, uh, like, you know, their team right now, if we analyze it, they're probably, you know, underdog by, you know, two, three touchdowns. But that doesn't mean that that team can't win any given right. Sunday. So if we pray hard and with the, all the support that we're getting and with all the public support and everybody's prayers and donations and everything, I think uh, maybe this could we could have a happy ending and and a free you know and 
and beat this terrorist. You know, I spoke to Malcolm Nance, and he believes he believes wholeheartedly that uh, Ukraine can win, and he's not alone in that assessment. There's quite Absolutely. a few experts who watch this, you know, who do this for a living, and they're like, "Oh yeah, Ukraine can." Well, now so, th- this this is an important part of the war. Uh, what's going to take place in the next week is extremely important, and that's why this organization is extremely important because uh, the fight is going to happen in Odessa. Uh, Mariupol is already down. Here's some hike of, uh, and right now they need all the support we can give them because if they could withstand us, or because Kiev kicked his ass and threw him out, he wasn't able to take Kiev. If we could do the same thing right now uh, on the water in Odessa, I think we have a good chance of, you know, winning this war. So this is going to be crucial the next week. Um, once again, thoughts and prayers, uh, hearts and minds, everybody's with Ukraine right now. Thank you. God bless uh, you. Hey, just just uh, hold on for me. Don't don't hang up yet. Don't don't disappear. Okay. I need to sign off uh, with my my tweeps here. I'll be right back with you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining me for a wonderful episode of Storytime with BDD. I'm your host, BDD, aka Brooklyn Dad. And once again, if you have not yet gotten your shot, please do so. Please get your shot. Get your booster. Uh, if you are so inclined, wear your mask. It is a good idea. Uh, and I will see you Monday, same time, same place. I love you all. <coughs> Peace.